Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters. I would like to invite your participation with me today during this devotional. By a show of hands, how many of you have experienced confusion in your life regarding how prayers are being answered? By that I mean what voice is speaking to you? How many have been confused with regard to the difference between the Spirit of Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost? I believe that one of Satan's main thrusts to destroy the Lord's kingdom and his children would be to give to them a wrong conception, a wrong understanding in their mind regarding these matters. If I had a wrong or an inaccurate map of the city of Provo, and I wanted to find a particular destination, I would inevitably be lost. Not that I am not in the right territory, but that I have the wrong map or the wrong understanding of the territory. I wouldn't really know where I was or where the place I intended to go to was. I believe that this has taken place with many people in our church with regard to the subject of revelation and the functions of the Holy Ghost as differentiated from the functions of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I was very interested in President Lee's and President Kimball's first press conferences after they were made presidents of the church. The basic message which they gave to the world and to the church was to keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. And of course, if we study the messages of all of the prophets, that seems to be the burden of those messages. Now, what would this mean in light of this subject, focusing upon the role of the Spirit of Christ and the role of the Holy Ghost? Let's first examine the meaning of this message from the point of view of non-members of the church. It seems that this message would have great application for them. Keep the commandments. What are the commandments that they are familiar with? At least those in the, in the Judeo-Christian tradition. They have received the Ten Commandments. And most of the laws of the Western civilization are based upon those Ten Commandments. And we are told in modern revelation that if people will follow the light that they have been given, it will lead them to the covenant gospel. Let me quote from section 84 of our Doctrine and Covenants. And the Spirit giveth light to every man that cometh into the world, and the Spirit enlighteneth every man through the world that hearkeneth to the voice of the Spirit. The Spirit of Jesus Christ 
is given to every person coming into the world. And particularly, it will be manifested in those who have received the laws of God given through ancient prophets, particularly the Ten Commandments. And every one that hearkeneth to the voice of the Spirit cometh unto God, even the Father. And the Father teacheth him of the covenant. In other words, if a person outside this church will keep the Ten Commandments and follow their conscience, which will be a repository within them of those Ten Commandments, that awareness, and if they will follow it, it will lead them to a covenant gospel. Then when they enter into the covenant relationship with the Lord, they receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. They become members of his church and kingdom. For those who then are members of the church and kingdom, what are the commandments of the Lord? They would comprise the Ten Commandments and the basic laws of the land upon which they're based, which would be the predicate. The Ten Commandments would be the predicate or the foundation for those laws. Plus, they would keep the covenants they have entered into in the ordinances of the gospel, the promises that they have made, which would give them a more educated conscience. They are aware more fully of anyone outside the kingdom of really who they are and what their mission and role in life is and who God is and the role and mission of the Savior. That is a higher understanding and places, therefore, a greater responsibility or burden. They have a more educated conscience. They are more convicted by a feeling of guilt if they violate certain covenants that the world is not even aware of. In addition to these general commandments and these church principles and ordinances which apply to all members of the church, they have the Holy Ghost. If they truly receive it, it will give to them personal commandments. Personal commandments. Now to go back to President Lee and President Kimball's counsel. Keep the commandments is such a distillation expression because to those who are not members of the church it will bring them into the church. To those that are members of the church they will receive not only the general commandments which the world has received but also the ordinances and principles of the gospel applicable to all members of the church and in addition personal commandments from the Holy Ghost in giving to them guidance and direction in all of the activities and the affairs of their life. Now, their conscience is more educated than ever. They're educated regarding the world's enlightenment and the church's basic principles and doctrines, all of which is revelation, general revelation, but also with regard to personal revelation, personal commandments, regarding each individual stewardship. We have been told many times by the brethren words to this effect that you and I as members of the church have the same right of personal guidance and revelation in our area of jurisdiction, our stewardship, as the president of the church has in his stewardship. 
Let's look at one more scripture with regard to the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants, beginning with verse 12. Which light, he's speaking of the light of Christ, proceedeth forth from the presence of God to feel the immensity of space, the light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things, and which is the law by which all things are governed, even the power of God who sitteth upon his throne, who is in the bosom of eternity, who is in the midst of all things. Verse 11, And the light which shineth, which giveth you light, is through him who enlighteneth your eyes, which is the same light that quickeneth your understandings. From this we learn that the light of Christ is the creative and governing power for all things, for this universe, and for all of God's creations. It is everywhere present. I believe personally that it was given Christ's name because he was the one appointed in the pre-mortal life to be the Savior and Redeemer in mortality. And that it is really the power and spirit of God. We call it the light of Jesus Christ. And if it were to be withdrawn from us, we would lose our life immediately. Moses experienced a time of a partial withdrawal and he fell to the earth. And for the space of many hours, he did not even have his natural strength. And he proclaimed, I now know that man is nothing, which thing I had not supposed before. I believe that what the scientist calls nature is the spirit of Jesus Christ. I believe that what the Catholic and Protestant worlds call God is the spirit of Jesus Christ. And perhaps what all religions call God, it is everywhere present, it can dwell in a man's heart. I believe that what the humanist would call decency, what the man on the street would call common sense, is the spirit of Jesus Christ. We all are partakers of this spirit. The civilized world has the spirit of Jesus Christ, and if it will obey it, they will be led to the covenant gospel probably through members of the church and missionaries. They will pray in their own ways. I'll never forget the great impression I had in the, in the Irish mission, writing to new converts to obtain an understanding of their background and their conversion process. It was almost universal that they had been praying in some way or hungering in some way not necessarily our way but in some way they were hurting and desiring something more and many of them were trying to be truer to their consciences They were being prepared by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, Elder Bruce R. McConkie, in a message to Institute Seminary people on this campus several years ago, used this physical illustration to distinguish between the Spirit of Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost. It was very instructive and impressive to me. He said, the Spirit of the Holy Ghost could be parallel to a radio transmitter, compared to a radio transmitter. You and I to the radio receivers. 
and the radio waves would be the spirit of Jesus Christ. Who would be the announcers? The Father and the Son. Now that's a physical symbol which to me illustrates the difference. The Holy Ghost is a member of the Godhead who performs very specific functions on this earth to sanctify, to witness, to testify of the Father and Son and things pertaining to their kingdom, to confirm the promise of the Father when you and I enter into a covenant relationship in the waters of baptism and when we renew it in other ordinances to confirm the promise of the Father to us, his covenant children, that if we will live true, we will have peace in this world and eternal life in the world to come. The Holy Ghost then would give us guidance, personal revelation, personal commandments regarding the affairs of our life. President McKay taught that to all members of the church who are in the line of their duty, the Holy Ghost normally speaks through their conscience. Again, to the members of the church who are in the line of their duty, the Holy Ghost normally speaks through their conscience. Now, the Lord may choose many ways to speak, but it seems that the still small voice, the enlightened conscience or heart within a person, would be the natural one to normally choose unless it required some other way to reach a man in a way which was perhaps beyond the experience or the words of Christ which have been deposited within that conscience. Or if it required the imposition of keys, priesthood powers, or certain other special blessings, that would lie in the Lord's hands according to his purposes. But for most of us, most of the time, the Holy Ghost will speak through our consciences. The Spirit of Jesus Christ would be the medium through which the Holy Ghost, this member of the Godhead, performs his unique and special functions. Now, if you would participate again, I would like to ask four questions and ask you to carefully ponder the answers to these questions in your heart, your conscience. The still small voice will give to you an inward awareness to these questions. You won't hear a voice in your ear You'll feel it. You'll sense it. There's an awareness, particularly if you have educated your consciences through the teachings of the church and prayer and scripture study. First question. What do I need to do to draw closer to the living Christ? Can we pause for a few seconds and seriously consider the answer from our conscience to that question? What do I need to do to draw closer to the living Christ? A second question. What do I need to do to be a better member of my family? 
whatever role that may be, father, mother, son, daughter, brother, sister, Third question, what do I need to do to more fully magnify my church membership and callings, and particularly for the male members who hold the priesthood to magnify my priesthood? Really listen and sense what your conscience is saying to you. Final question, what do I need to do to more fully magnify my stewardship as a student here at Brigham Young University, or as a faculty person or staff person, whatever role it may be? How many here can honestly acknowledge that you know many things, perhaps, that you need to do in these categories? How many would also acknowledge that if you and I were to really do these things, marvelous things would take place in our lives, and that we fully know that? I often ask myself, why do I wait? What am I waiting for? I really believe that that which you and I sensed within ourselves is personal revelation. Our conscience is the repository of all of that divine education. And if we really are still and listen, to those kinds of questions, which to me are the prioritized stewardships of our life, we will get this guidance. If an angel of the Lord were to come into this devotional assembly today and stand in the air, clothed in power and glory, and give to each of us the same messages that we have received from the still small voice within, what would we think of that experience? I'm sure we'd be terribly impressed and perhaps go to our deathbeds testifying of it when constrained to do so. And yet I believe, in a sense, that which you and I have received is of a higher order of revelation, less dramatic, but of a higher order of revelation than if an angel of the Lord from the other world were to give to us these messages. Angels minister by the power of the Aaronic priesthood. The Holy Ghost ministers by the power of the Melchizedek priesthood. Jesus said to his disciples, More blessed are those who believe and have not seen than those who believe and have seen. The prophet Joseph once counseled a man who was critical of himself because he didn't come out of the waters of baptism prophesying and speaking in tongues as someone else had. You had more believing blood and elucidated that those who are of the blood of Israel will often experience less dramatic physical kinds of manifestations than those who are being adopted into the blood. I believe sometimes that as Latter-day Saints we are like fish who discover water last. We are so immersed in the element as to be unaware of its presence. We have been immersed in the revelations of the Lord in this dispensation. No dispensation can compare to this one. And the level of light and knowledge about man's true nature and our mission and the level of ordinances that can be performed for the living and for the dead in the temple of the Lord 
transcends that which has given, been given to any other dispensation. In a sense, this is the dispensation of the Holy Ghost. We don't experience the personal ministry of the Savior in our presence, but that isn't as great as the Holy Ghost. He even said to his disciples, it's necessary that I must go or the Holy Ghost will not come. You can imagine their feeling about that because every time they would leave the Savior, they would fall apart and desert him. There wasn't one disciple that did not, including, as we know, the chief disciple Peter. But before he did finally leave them after his resurrection, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Ghost. It's possible to be given a gift and receive not that gift. But they prayed, the scripture says, and they stayed together and fellowshiped each other and read his words and remembered his words, read the words of the scriptures and remembered the words of their Savior. And then on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came like cloven tongues of fire. And then the real conversion processes under the influence of the gifts of the Spirit changed these otherwise weak men into indefatigable disciples, champions of the truth, right to their martyrs' deaths. Nephi became so sensitive to the still small voice that he could dialogue with it when he was commanded to slay Laban. But he had such familiarity with that voice through long obedience that he knew it was the Lord's voice. Laman and Lemuel had no familiarity with it. It required an angel to come to them and to shake them. It had to break into their sensual world so that their senses could recognize what had happened. They were not changed before nor after the appearance of the angel. I believe many people in our church are often looking beyond the mark, looking for some more mystical, dramatic, mysterious manifestation, and maybe denying all of the while the real true spirit of revelation of the Holy Ghost to their own soul. I spoke at a devotional a couple of years ago at Rick's college and a girl came up afterwards and said, Brother Covey, what is the difference between a heartburn and a burning in the heart? She was really asking, how do I really know how God answers prayers? How do I know it's just not me projecting my own wish and want onto God, feeling good about it and calling it his answer? That's what she was asking. And I believe many of us have asked that question of ourselves. And I said to her, when we had this little listening exercise, sister, did you feel or sense anything? Oh, yes, yeah, she said, I know so many things I need to do to be a better person. Then, sister, I suggest you forget your question. Just do those things. If you do, you'll become acquainted with the voice, and that'll be the answer to your question. You didn't like that answer, did you, sister? No, why not? She says, I have no excuse anymore. A year later, I spoke up there at another devotional on another subject. She came up afterwards and said, Brother Covey, do you remember me? Can't quite place you. I was the one that asked you about the heartburn. Oh, yes, whatever happened to you? She said, I did those things. I took it seriously. She said, I know very clearly the difference now between the true voice and the many other voices within and without. I said, for instance, what did you do? She said, for one thing, I really began to study the scriptures in a serious way. My prayers were more earnest and sincere and deep. I made reconciliation with certain individuals who I thought I could just forget because I didn't like them. I was more cooperative at home, more helpful. I stopped procrastinating as a student, self-management by crisis. She said, I put it off. I used to put it off all the time. I became more conscientious. I realized this was a stewardship I have to be a student, as well as a stewardship for my family and for my church. 
She said, I started doing genealogy work. I was more pleasant with my brothers and sisters. I didn't speak back to my parents. I just became a less defensive and angry person. I was on a Know Your Religion circuit in California this last year, and she came up and said, Would you be interested in the third installment? I said I would. She said, I can't believe the difference in my life. Once I started to realize that the Holy Ghost is my own guide if I will listen to, to him and that I can receive personal guidance and revelation and that as long as I am true to it, that all things will work together for my good or words to that effect. She bore her testimony. There was no confusion in her mind anymore. President Lee said to a group of missionaries in England, in answer to the question, President Lee, what is the most important of all of the commandments? He answered, The most important commandment is the one you're having the greatest difficulty living. You can see why. If a person would be true to the whispering of that still small voice regard some of the, regarding some of those matters that you and I just heard, other things would happen. If we're true to the, that, then other things would happen. Many people who want to have answers to big decisions or intellectual dilemmas up here but are not really open and receptive to the whisperings of the Spirit down here will continue to remain confused up here. The principle in my mind is this. If you're confused about a matter, be true to that which you know is right. And in the Lord's time, and according to his purposes, you will be given enlightenment and understanding regarding the matter you were confused about. It may be a big decision. It may be an intellectual question that you have in your mind. I remember in Arizona at a... At a They called it a Religion in Life Week. I was invited to be a religious uh, representative of our church, along with other representatives of other churches. The second night there, I was invited to speak to a sorority fraternity exchange at the Kayamega House on the subject of the numerality. I basically gave our church's approach to it, that chastity is an eternal law, that the numerality is really the old immorality, and so forth. I felt very alone because there seemed to be considerable difference in thinking. Two individuals were very articulate in expressing their opposition to my position. One in front said basically, well, I don't know, it seems to me that true mature love gives more freedom than you're giving it. I tried to reason and indicate that if you were to take poison, what would happen, even if you were unaware of it? and that if you violate the law of chastity, you will suffer great consequences. And uh, he argued against this, indicating that this didn't give the kind of freedom that a careful, mature, responsible love would give people. Another spoke against it. And I remembered the scripture in Revelations, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. So I asked them, Would you listen for just a minute? and inwardly sense what might happen, what the real answer to this question that we have tonight is. I'll ask a question, and you be still and listen, and I'll promise you, you will sense inwardly, you won't hear it in your ear, that what I've been speaking about is true on this principle of chastity, which I had defined earlier, and... and uh, they became kind of still a little. Some of them were looking around to see who was going to take it seriously. And I really pressed the point, just listen for one minute. And during that quiet minute, I asked the question, now, is chastity, as I have explained it tonight, a true principle or not? Paused. The end of a full minute, I turned to the fellow who had been the spokesman in front, and he, I asked him, my friend, in all honesty, what did you feel? He said, what did you hear? He said, what I heard is not what I've been saying. 
I asked the other, what did you hear? He said, I don't know. I just don't know anymore. One stood up in the back, independent, spontaneously on his own, and said, I want to say something to my fraternity brothers I've never said before. I believe in God. And he sat down. Completely different spirit was present. It softened everybody. They were very interested in the restored gospel and in the Book of Mormon. We invited many to the Institute of Religion and gave some books out. Final question I'd like to just look at for a moment is, how do you educate your conscience? I suggest five principles. First, if you really want an educated conscience, feast regularly upon the words and the love of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Really seriously make it a daily program to study the scriptures. Ponder them and meditate upon them. Be still. Maybe only a verse that day. But you're going to the word of the Lord. Memorize some of them. It's like programming a computer. Get them into your heart. If you feast upon the words of Christ, then the Holy Ghost will bring to your remembrance the things you need to do based upon the guidance that you have received on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. The church will teach us principles and the Holy Ghost will teach us specific practices, specific applications. Second, when you pray, listen. Look on it not as a time to counsel the Lord, but as a time to take counsel from Him. I really believe too many times we go down a checklist in a sense telling the Lord who to bless, how, where, and when, and directing Him around the universe and the heavens instead of being still, sensing a relationship, and listening, and then responding to what you hear. Feasting on the words and the love of Christ will instill the desire to listen. Third, covenant. Commit to obey what you hear. Unify and marshal the will and the energy within you to say, I take this stewardship. I will do these things. Fourth, keep the covenant. Keep the commitment. Fifth, return and report. Give an accounting of your stewardship. You will feel the still voice say within you, I commend you for your integrity. Very good, my son, my daughter. This labor is acceptable. Then the next level and the next level. I believe that if people will do this, they can develop purity of mind and of heart. If you have temptations toward impure thoughts, try it. Feast on the words and the love of Christ, then ask the Lord to give you a heightened awareness or sensitivity toward any tempting environment. Then commit to the Lord that the moment that sensitivity is given to you, you will turn from it and do some worthy thing. Then keep your commitment. One student said to me, all my lot, mature life I've had trouble with bad thoughts, even during my mission. Whenever I was asked the question, are you morally clean, I answered, yes, because I was considering my practices. But I always had some plaguing feelings about my thoughts. He said, we were walking into the final examination one day, he said, Brother Covey, I can look you in the eye and say, I am morally clean, right to my core. What did he do? For a period of several months, he feasted on the words of Christ, asked the Lord for a heightened awareness of temptation, turned immediately at the very first onset of that temptation and did worthy things, went back to his divine purposes and his work. Brother Packer said, hum a hymn, memorize the scripture. And he did it. And the Holy Ghost, I believe, purged much of that other disposition right out of his nature. I express my testimony, dear brothers and sisters, with all my heart. I believe that we are immersed in the revelations of the greatest dispensation, the restoration dispensation, and that we have available to us at any moment the whisperings of the still small voice, the Holy Ghost, and that if we will take pains regularly to educate it, to train it, 
It will be a continuing source of personal revelation to us. I testify, born out of the Spirit of the living God to my soul, I know that this is true. I know that the Father and the Son appeared to the Prophet Joseph Smith and restored this gospel and established the church that teach the gospel. I also know what's possible to be active in the church in one sense at least and not to be active in the gospel. To be active in the gospel is a continuous responsibility and stewardship of seeking and living by the Holy Spirit. I bear witness that you are God's covenant children. We are all children of the promise. Our life is a mission and not a career. And the Holy Ghost will use us to the blessing of all of our Father in Heaven's children. I testify also of Jesus Christ. I love the words. I believe in Christ as I believe in the rising sun. Not because I can see it, but by it I can see everything else. He is the life and light of the world. He speaks to his prophet, President Kimball, and to each of us if we will but listen and educate our conscience. And I pray, God, that we will do so in the sacred name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.